Um, I'm going to start recording. So good morning, everybody. Pleasure to be with you all again, to learn with you all again. I hope you had a good week and are enjoying some walks in the nice weather. Um, so just wanted to do like a, two little preambles before we get started. So maybe three, we'll see. So just a reminder of like my vision of how I like to teach that I always want these things to feel personal to you. I want to feel like it's hitting something that feels relevant to you right now in the world. So always feel free to share how this is hitting you on a personal level. That's very important to me in my teaching. So feel free to do that. Um, I'd like to ask, I realized I did not do this the last time, so I'll do it this time. In all my classes, I'd like for, to just get a little bit of a communication guidelines in the beginning. So there are some people who love to talk in group settings. There are some people who are more hesitant to talk in group settings. I would love to just uh, remind the people who talk a lot to step back occasionally and let other people step forward. And for those of you who don't always like talking in group settings to step forward, I always like hearing your voices. I may call on you and ask you if you're willing to speak if you haven't spoken and you can always say no. Um, but I really love to hear from everyone. So that's one thing. And the other part of the communication piece is, sorry, I'm just like someone else in. Um, that everything that's happening in the world right now hits on a very personal basis and a political basis and it's easy to speak in broad strokes so just love to remind everyone there are people of different political views here let's try to speak for ourselves um, and not for large groups um, and let's not try to stereotype other large groups and just say how this stuff is hitting you personally as you or your family but don't make it any larger than that okay so that's the little preamble so we're gonna jump into the Parsha in a second, and I just wanna, we're gonna do the end piece of the Parsha. Um, oh, lots of people coming in now, okay. Um, so we're still in the Book of Numbers. They're still traveling in the desert, and um, up until this point, there has been a fire. Guy got really angry, and there was a fire that wiped a lot of the Israelites out. Um, they, started fetching. This is a Parsha with a lot of fetching. So they started fetching about the manna. Oh, hello, Vivian. Um, hello, Ed and Estelle. I see we had a bunch of people join us. Hi, Gail. Hi, Marjorie. Okay, excellent. Um, so they're fetching. They get consumed by fire. There's a plague throughout the camp. They start fetching about the manna, that it's too boring. They want different things to eat. Then God sends down the quail and it's so much it's coming out of their teeth and a bunch more of them die. So there's like a lot of fetching and a lot of transition and the Israelites are not doing so well in their wanderings in the deserts. Um, it has not been an easy time of change and transition for them. So what I wanted to talk about today for those of you who saw the source sheets are what are the multiple ways we can respond in times of uncertainty and transition and change, which certainly feels relevant to the world we are in right now. Um, so we're gonna look at two different ways to respond from Miriam and from Aaron at the end of the Parsha. We're gonna look at a very little snippet of text, just like we did the last time with me. Um, I like to kind of zoom in, especially in these settings on a little bit of the Torah text. See what you guys think of it. I always think it's important to look at a text with new eyes and then we'll go into all of the different commentators. So that is the plan. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. And we will get going, excellent. So just a reminder, um, if you can't see properly, um, you might just, the whole sheet, you, there's like little buttons on the side where you can just see me talking or whoever is talking. You can always change to that setting. Um, it's just the like fat little bar on the top right hand side, um, but hopefully everybody can see. So, so we'll get into how do we respond to others during times of uncertainty and change. And did someone have a question? Sorry. I'm like someone was talking. No. Okay. So, would someone like to unmute themselves and read the numbers text in English to us? I'll read it. Great, thank you, Michael. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman he had married. He married a Cushite woman, they said. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Has God not spoken through us as well? The Lord heard it. Now Moses was a very humble man more so than any other man on earth. Thank you very much. So this is a very interesting text. Um, I purposely wanted to bring all three verses because they don't necessarily seem like they have anything necessarily to connect to each other. Um, you'll see how the, the Mepharshim, the commentators put them all together. But before we get into that, 
again, I love to just have people sort of say their own opinion first. So does anyone have any thoughts about what these three verses are doing all together and what do you think is happening in this story? Interesting. I think one of the things that's interesting is that we... she's still... Go ahead. Can you... Um... Can you to... Before we proceed, sure. could we establish uh, where the, the, um, the, the Pentateuch says or gives evidence that Moses was a very humble man more so than any other man on earth? So this is where it says it in the text. This is the first time we see that's, it. That's what they're saying about him, but where does he show, where does he give evidence of this humility? That is an excellent question, and the commentators have a field day with that. So excellent okay. question. Keep thinking about it. We're, not, we're gonna get into it a little bit, not too, too much, but yeah, this is the first time it appears. So it's, it's an I, interesting question. I think there's an interesting thing here is that, she, that uh, his wife is referred to as a Kushite woman. She's yes. been referred as Midianite until now, as I recall. Yeah, so, so excellent point, Howard. So we're gonna, we're gonna get into that of, is this a different wife? Is this Sipora, who we said was Midianite? What's happening here? That, yes, exactly. Very good point. I have a, a comment about the three siblings. Sure, uh, go ahead. It seems to me that Moses, as being the youngest of the three, is there an echo or is that me? There's a little bit of an echo. Um, anyway, Moses, as the youngest of the three, was vulnerable to being uh, chastised, perhaps. Or Ed, 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 I think you might be on on two devices. Can you turn one of them off? Yeah, let me. I'll be back. Okay. All right, Ed will be back in the meantime. Um, yes, I see Walter. Go ahead. I don't think you are. I just opened it. Oh, okay. Here, Walter, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, answer the call to go back down to uh, Mitzrayim uh, to free his people. And he makes all sorts of excuses. And that shows humility. Mm -hmm. So sorry, the beginning of that was called off, Walter. So you're saying that humility is because when God called him, he didn't necessarily want to do it. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Hi, can I say something also? Um, sure. You, you were asking about the, the relationship of the sentences. Yeah. It seems <clears throat> that they're using <clears throat> that he married a Kushite woman as a negative because, um, what, you know, they're asking, why has the Lord only spoken to Moses? After all, he married a Kushite woman. I mean, that's the way I'm reading it. Right. So in spite of the fact that he married this, this woman who is, is an... The, the way we've been thinking about other people, she's an other, and, and yet he still continues to speak to, through him, and aren't we just as good, if not better, because we kind of stayed within our own, our own community. Yeah, beautiful. So that's definitely one of the, the aspects we're gonna look into. Thank you, Ellen, very much. Um, um, to say, uh, like, why, why is this? Wait, hold on one second. Why is this the, why is this what they're fetching about, right? I said this is a Parsha of fetching. So why is this the thing that they're fetching about with Moses? And again, like this was sort of the, what I found the most interesting when I was looking at it this time is how are they dealing with this Christian woman, this, uh, this other, right? Um, this person who is not of them for whatever reason and how are they dealing with her? And we'll see that there's two very different responses in how the commentators read it. Yes, and was that Ed again? Who wanted to I, talk? Think, I think I'm back now, I'm on one device, no echo. Um, okay, great. And then I see a bunch of hands and I'll call on you afterwards, I promise. As I read this, I had the thought that uh, Moses was the youngest of the siblings of the three. And he was, of course, vulnerable. Me being the youngest of uh, five, I know how he felt, perhaps. Uh, everybody knew better than I did. They were all older, uh, a little more. They were allowed to do more things, more privileged. Uh, and I think that they were just critical of them, right. that's all. Okay, great, Being thank you for sharing. Sure. All right, so I see a bunch of hands. So I first saw, I wrote it down, Brant, then Ellie, then Arthur. Can I get you coffee here? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I lowered my hand back down, but what, oh. I was going, what I was going to say is very brief. Uh, I think that this is the first time in the Torah that it's stating that uh, now, Moses was a very humble man, more so than any other man on earth. Uh, that, that 
in the future, moving forward, that gets repeated many times. But I think the reason why they're, they're, uh, that it's placed here is to put such an emphasis on uh, those who criticize Moses being the opposite of humble. They're so arrogant uh, that they criticized him. So, so that's just my take. I don't yeah, know. beautiful. I know the commentators pick up on that. Some of them will say some of them I didn't bring because there were too many, but beautiful <laughs> comments. All right, Ellie <laughs> was next. Go ahead. Am I unmuted? Yeah, yeah you're unmuted. Go um, ahead. Well, they grew up in different households completely. Um, yeah, I see what Ed was saying about uh, being the youngest, but he didn't know he had siblings until much later on. I mean, he grew up in privilege. Yeah. He was in the palace. Also, is there an implication that he abandoned Zephora buried in here someplace? So we'll talk right about that. Her. We'll talk about that, yeah. It's an excellent question. And, and then I love that you guys have picked up on almost everything the commentators picked up on. So <laughs> beautiful, well done. All right, uh, Arthur, go ahead. Well, I, I don't know if this is the uh, 14,000 pound elephant in the room, but uh, this woman uh, is described as a Kushite, as a Kushi. And Kush was Ethiopia, and she was a Negro woman. And, uh, yeah. you know, for whatever that represents in this year of BC, 1200 or whenever it was, uh, here was Moses taking up with uh, uh, an African American woman. Very, yeah. very timely. Uh, Subject, and he was and he was catching heat from his family for taking up with a an African American woman. She wasn't American. Right. Right. So certainly, <laughs> certainly a black woman. Let's go with that. Um, but yes, I think thank you for bringing it up, Arthur. And one of the reasons this felt particularly relevant to right now is um, right. It seems like there could definitely be some racism happening. That why are they bringing up what she? Why are they not using her name? Right. And if you've studied with me before, like I'm always fascinated of who gets named and who doesn't especially women. So why does she not get named? And why is she only referred to as the Kushite woman? So we're going to talk about that. So not, not the 14,000 pound elephant. So thank you for bringing it up. Um, excellent comment. So let's take like one or two more. So I see Terry. Um, I'll start with Terry and then I'll keep scrolling through. And then, yeah, go ahead, Terry. Well, I think some of it is just old fashioned sibling rivalry. And I know when I was teaching the kindergarten and first grade, parents would come and talk about, you know, the kids not getting along. And I would say, look, you know, Cain and Abel was the second story in the Bible. It didn't start with you. It's not going to end with you. So some of it is, is just the older sibling saying something about the, uh, about the younger sibling. And the idea that like they've been, you know, so good and here, he, you know, who knows, maybe they wanted to, they, they had affairs with non-Jewish, non-MOT people and they didn't continue with it, but Moses went ahead and married this Cushite woman. Oh, so, that's just making a little bit. Yeah, so definitely I think there's some sibling rivalry happening for sure. Um, right, and the relationship between these siblings is complicated. Like someone said, they didn't grow up together. Um, right. Relationships with siblings is always complicated, even when you grow up together. So certainly when you spend however many years apart, it makes it very complicated. Well, um, I think the, the other piece is that not only did they not grow up together, but he grew up in something completely different where he would have been the other. Right. And I think what's happening today, and you see it throughout so many things, that the younger generations don't, you know, that everyone is all mixed together and, and more into marriage and things. And that is, it's just a part of it where you see people as people rather than uh, making them part of a group. Yeah, beautiful. So we're going to talk about the fact that he grew up as an other and how that affects him. So. Joe, I saw raised his hand a while ago, Barry, and then we're gonna go on to the commentators and anyone else holding a comment, just hold it till later. So Joe, go ahead. Thank you. So it may be a small point uh, because not in the translation, but in the Hebrew, uh, God hears the rest of us. But in the reference to Moses, it says God speaks only, speaks through him. But for the rest of us, God speaks through us and also hears us. I wonder, why the distinction is made. Yeah, 
Right. So how, right. And I, we didn't get, I'm not, we're not going to get so much into that because there's so much commentary on these three verses, you wouldn't believe it. But um, yeah, they certainly talk about the difference between how God communicates with Moses versus with anyone else. And God and Moses had a very special relationship that didn't really happen again with any other prophet and certainly was not happening with Miriam and Aaron. So it's interesting that they bring that up because it's actually a very different relationship with all of them, even though Aaron and Miriam are also seen as prophets. All right, so very last comment, and then we're gonna go on to the commentators. Yeah, essentially, I think that <clears throat> Miriam is saying, you know, what am I just chopped liver? And I think that critique has some credibility because if you go all the way back, uh, if I have this right, Pharaoh, you know, had a decree that all of the firstborn uh, males would be slaughtered. And the way the Isra Israelites dealt with it was not to, you know, they were not going to have any children at all. And it was Miriam who intervened with her parents and said, you know, that, that gives Pharaoh more of a victory than we really have to give Pharaoh. So without that, Moses might have never been. And in addition to that, when he was put in the basin in the river, she overlooked that to make sure that things proceeded the way they did. Yep. So I think a critique, uh, uh, I think it's a critique of God is, is meaningful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, right. There's a lot, of, a lot of commentaries that also pick up on that. Of, you know, Miriam did a lot to save him as a child. Um, I'm going to show you commentary from a book that I love that I actually have at home called Moses' Women, which is basically like a lot of different midrashim about Moses, but basically saying it was all these different women. I'll send it out in the chat afterwards. Um, Thank you. Um, but that all these different women basically helped save Moses. Um, and that without them, you know, we wouldn't, the women who saved Moses enabled him to save the Jewish people, but the Israelites, which helped create the Jewish people, and without them, um, he would have been toast. So yes, Miriam is certainly <laughs> one of those women. All right, so great. We're going to go into the commentaries now. I see there's a few other hands raised, but hopefully you'll have more to say as we keep going. So I want to look at, um, again, tons you could say about this text, but I want to look at, again, how do they respond to this Kushite woman? Um, and there's two very, very different ways that the commentaries um, interpret what they're doing. So we're going to get into the first one, which is uh, when things are uncertain, what do you do? You accuse and blame the other whoever that other is, however you label them or decide that they're an other. Um, but someone who is not you, when you're in a situation where you feel threatened, that it's much easier to blame someone else. For those of you who learned with me during Shavuot, it's a little bit of what Sarah is doing to Hagar, right? So it's how do we treat the other when the other is in our midst? So I'm going to ask someone to read the Ibn Ezra, and then we're going to read the Dad's Gideon, read. which are two different commentaries. Oh, great. And, um, and then we're going to talk about both of them together. So. Uh, I, I heard I'll read, but I didn't actually see who it was. So go ahead, whoever said that. Ruth. Oh, hi, Ruth. Great. What seems right to me is that the Cushite woman is Zipporah, for she was a Midianite. And the Midianites are Ishmaelites and dwell in tents like the Cushites. The tents of Cushan, the pavilions of the land of Midian, there was no whiteness in them at all. Because of the intense heat of the sun, Zipporah was therefore black, resembling a Kushite woman. Right, so I see Arthur's like, yeah, so this is right. So this seems to really be saying that the thing that they are accusing Moses of is miring someone who's black, and that there's no white in her at all, right? So we'll get back to that one. All right, and Ruth, now read the dots game. For he had married a woman from the land of Cush, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, according to Moses' biography. Moses had been king in that country, and his wife had been a queen at that time previously. Moses had ruled over that land for a period of 40 years before coming to Midian. This is why the Torah reported Mir Miriam and Aaron are speaking critically only of Moses. Did God only speak with Moses? They thought that seeing that God had spoken with Moses, Moses had felt that no Jewish woman was good enough for him to marry. That is, that he had given himself air. They did not criticize Moses for having married Zipporah, as he had done so in circumstances where he was a refugee from Egyptian justice at the time. Okay, great. So I just want to... Um 
share a little background, I guess, of what this is. So there's an amazing midrash, really super long. Happy to send you the really long one if you want. That there's this whole other part of Moses's life that we don't talk about, where he went to Ethiopia, became king of that country for 40 years, married this queen, and only then sort of, you know, came back to the Israelites. Super fascinating that they make up this whole backstory for him. Um, so we can talk about, you know, we'll talk about that. But um, basically the idea is this was a different wife than Sipora, And you can see why mo that Aaron and Miriam were upset because like it says here that he felt no Jewish, good, Jewish woman was good enough for him to marry. Um, and he had given himself heirs, meaning he was being the opposite of humble. So I'd love to hear some thoughts on these two texts of what Miriam and Aaron are criticizing Moses for and uh, how they strike you. I think there are some popular decisions that had to be made about where to go and how to get going to go where they were going, presumably Israel. And I think that the way to criticize God was to criticize his appointee. And uh, because uh, they knew it better than to criticize God. So they said it was Moses who did this. But Moses humble is really saying he walked in the ways of the Lord and he listen to what God had told him to do. Hmm. So, you, so you don't think they're actually criticizing Moses at all, really? They're just using Moses as a way to criticize God? I don't think at all is the right words to use. I think it's like, like everything else, a combination of things. Got it. Yeah, beautiful. OK. Um, anyone else, especially someone who hasn't spoken yet? What do you think of these texts? And how do you think Miriam and Aaron come across in these two texts? So I think from what Ibn Ezra says, it sort of is a stretch to get to the Kushan. In other words, he was a Midianite, and then the Midianites are like the Ishmaelites, and, the, and then the Ishmaelites are like the Kushites. So it's almost as if they were stretching things in order to find something to criticize. And the Kushites seem to be perhaps easy to criticize, so therefore, they linked Moses to a Kushite while, you know, rather than the straightforward, in other words, it would have been more difficult to criticize him for, for marrying a Midianite. Mm. So it's sort of like, it's, e it's easier to criticize someone who seems farther away, and so they're kind of wrapping themselves in knots to, um, to criticize his wife. Well, as I say, they, they want to find a reason to criticize, and... Yeah. So it's two things. A, they're finding a reason to criticize, and B, Kushites are easier to criticize than Midianites. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Brands, go ahead, I see how your hand raised. All right, you're muted. And then Suzanne, I see you. Okay. I've got it. Um, I can't remember where I read it, but um... As I recall, they were really criticizing uh, Moses for uh, divorcing Zipporah, not marrying Zipporah. Uh, yes, Zipporah. we're going to get to that. That's our next set of texts. So you're, you're leading into the next batch. We'll okay. get there soon. Okay. Beautiful. All right, Suzanne, and then I see Walter. Go ahead, Suzanne. Just unmute you. Am I OK? Now you're good. OK. Um, I see the jealousy issue coming to the fore again, and that um, Moses is giving himself air and um, uh, exactly who is he following, we're doing the right things, and how come he can get away with doing something else. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that'll come up again when we get to the, you know, divorce narrative. Um, with Sephora, but right, it's like, why is he allowed to be different than we are? Why does he get the exceptions to the rules? Um, but we don't. Beautiful. All right, and I think I saw Joe had raised his hand. No, not anymore. Okay, you're just your thing is still up, great. Um, I'm gonna call on some people who haven't spoken yet to see if there's anything you wanna say. Um, Arian, is there anything you wanna say about these two texts? Let's just unmute you. This is my thought, and I just think that Perhaps they made assumptions without checking them out. A lot of people do that. They make assumptions without knowing all the facts. And perhaps that's what happened here. Yep. Uh, 
very beautiful, always relevant that we often assume many things about people that we shouldn't and don't actually ask to see if it's true um, and how important it is to actually be in dialogue and conversation with each other. Thank you, Marion. Beautiful. So glad I, I asked if you wanted to say anything. Gail, do you have anything you would like to say? Unmute you. I'm okay. I'm just listening. This is my uh, first um, session of this, so I'm just okay. listening. No Thanks. problem. No problem. And Erica, do you have anything you'd like to say? And then we'll just go to people raising their hands. I, when was that written, the dad's opinion? Um, I will have to double check. Um, I do not remember exactly. Okay. Why, what are you curious about? Well, <laughs> uh, I think the prejudices have become more in the fore and more, we're more aware of our prejudices now. If this were written, say, 300 years ago or more, then it's an interesting self-awareness on the, on the part of the person who wrote this. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, we don't know that is giving self airs. That seems very modern, you know? Um, so that's why I was curious to know what it was. Yeah, I just looked quickly. Um, it was first printed in 1783, so. Which one? Dad's gay name. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah, if that helps. OK. Um, great. So anyone else who has their hand raised, and then we'll go. OK, Vivian, great. Go ahead. Uh, I think it may be a status issue, um, because uh, Moses obviously came from a higher status uh, and probably had in, uh, had been involved with people from all over the, their kingdom through his lifetime. He was familiar with all of the various peoples of the world. And uh, clearly, um, the, you know, his siblings were not. They had been brought up within their own community. So um, I think there was a, a difference in the way um, Moses looked at women and felt you know, they were all out there. We could pick any, whereas uh, his siblings knew you could only pick from within your own community. Mm. And so so that comes out of letting God ahead. for, you know, letting him be in that position, I guess, or perhaps jealousy as well. Mm. All right. So it's sort of out of a position of privilege that he could marry out. Uh, well, he had come from a position of privilege, and now right. he was still in a position of privilege, and. Not that he took advantage of it, it was just his nature yeah. from his yeah. background. Right, very interesting. And how much it affects where we grow up and how we grow up. And that even siblings, right? We're, so this is like the um, nature versus nurture, right? That even if, you know, right. theoretically their genetics were very different because they were raised in such different places, they turned out very differently. Right. Beautiful. Uh, Barry, go ahead. Um, not to minimize the issue of Kushite or not Kushite, and certainly the commentaries, you know, I think, you know, take it to the end of the world. I don't think the Kushite issue is talked about so much in the rest of the Pasha. Pasha. It's as if that is an entree for what is basic, really deep down on the minds of particularly Miriam and I guess Aaron also about this differential in prophecy. I think that, you know, it's as if you, you want to tell somebody, you want to wrote something with someone, but it's, before you do that, there's kind of a prelude to it because it's hard to get to it right away. So I see the Kushite issue, again, not to minimize it, but somewhat of a red herring. Mm. Right, and I, you know, living with the toddler, right? My, like that's such a human instinct to, to see that, you know, she often flips out about something else, but she's really upset about something much deeper, but it's just easier to get upset about her missing toy than to say to us, you know, I'm sad that I've been stuck inside for three months which you wouldn't necessarily know, but um, right, of how easy it is for, it for us, especially with people we love, to pick fights about something which seems silly and small, um, but actually is about something much more systemic and larger. Beautiful point. Okay, so I don't see any other hands raised right at the moment. So let's go 
to the next text. I just want to make sure we get to everything. So this is by an author named Yael Unterman. It was in the Times of Israel. The link's on the bottom of the source sheet that I sent you. Um, and I just thought it was a very, a very interesting take on um, what exactly Moses and, I'm sorry, what about what Miriam and Aaron are criticizing Moses for here. And again, a lot about that otherness, how they grew up differently. So I wanted to share it with you. So I'm going to ask someone who hasn't spoken yet if they'd be willing to read. Bonnie, would you be willing to read for us? Okay. Um, unlike Miriam and Aaron, who grew up among the Israelites in Egypt, Moses grew up in Pharaoh's palace as a non-Jew, disconnected from his own people. He then fled to Midian, lived once again among non-Jews, and married into the family of an idol-worshipping priest, Jethro. In brief, Moses spent his life among those who were other to, were other to him. It was a mode familiar to him, for he had long practice in doing so. Thus, when God chose him to receive prophecy at a level never before or since attained and to give the Torah through him, making him the ultimate other, a human being given an experience no other human had shared, impossible even to describe, setting him apart. He already had the inner psychological vessel prepared and available to contain such a role. Beautiful. You okay to keep going? Uh, sure. Miriam and Aaron, in all their greatness, lacked this vessel within them. They had grown up in the house of their parents among their people. Their protest related to this very issue. They viewed Moses as breaking the rules in some way, separating from Zipporah or marrying out of the tribe, and attributed it to hubris following God speaking to him or through him. They were, they were mistaken, however, as verse 3 clarifies for us. Moses was humble, not arrogant. No, Moses was not arrogant, but he was outside the rules in that he was quintessentially other. Hence, speaking symbolically now, we can suggest that when Moses marries the Cushite woman, he's embracing marrying his own otherness to the full, perhaps accepting fully, finally, that he will never be like anyone else. The more God spoke through him, the less of a regular human he became. Perhaps Miriam and Aaron, to judge them a little more favorably, sensed this and could not bear to fully and finally accept the separation from him that this would entail, as their beloved younger brother, who Miriam saved from the watery death, he could not quite use. They did not wish him to marry his otherness. They wished to keep him in this world with them. Okay. Saw, thank you very much, Bonnie. So I saw a lot of nodding. Um, along with that. So I'd love to hear your takes on what do you think about um, Yale Unterman's take from Times of Israel about, you know, Moses being quintessentially other and what actually is happening in this little vignette that we see. Sheila and Mort, I see you uh, unmuted yourselves. Do you want to say something? No, I, we weren't. We were okay. okay, no problem. The I'm fact sure. that um, he has this relationship with God separate, they don't have it, and they feel it, and uh, that's still a cause of their uh, jealousy. Right. I, I, right. Find it, I find it interesting that in the situation that, we, that we're in today, if we could look at how the Jews all the way on the right think the way to to make make themselves better and more holy is to put more and more fences around themselves and making them more and more insular and separating themselves from anything that's perceived as the other. And here, Moses, who everybody can agree is the, is the, is the greatest of all of us, was chosen because he was the other. I think that's, that's a very interesting dichotomy that, that the people on the right are, are moving more and more away from the thing that made Moses so special. Hmm. Because he was other than the rest of the, say a little bit more, Ellen, because he was other than the rest of the Jews, because it seems to me by building more fences, if they're trying to other themselves from the rest of society, maybe they're trying to model him in some capacity. But no, no, they make, but it's saying that, that he was the other and that he had more experiences. He was, he was not, he was not living amongst his own people. He was not marrying the people, the, the woman that, that was, that he was supposed, he wasn't doing anything he was supposed to be doing. 
and he was re and, and he was deemed to be the one who could receive all of the, all of the 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 um the wisdom from god mm -hmm. while miriam and aaron who were doing quote the right things were considered not not that their vessel wasn't quite ready to receive all of this because they had been so insular. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Um, right, so like where does this otherness come from? What does that mean exactly in relationship to God? Yeah, beautiful. Suzanne, do you have a... Yeah. yeah go ahead. Am I unmuted? Yes, I'm you're good. Um, I find this interesting because Miriam was a prophetess, so she had to have her relationship with God. Aaron was the high priest, so there has to be the relationship with God. Why do they feel that um, they didn't have the same because they weren't given the Ten Commandments or, you know, I, I question why they're, they're feeling that way. Right, and I think it's an interesting point, right? So God's relationship with Moses is different, right? God speaks to face in a different way. So even though clearly Aaron and, and Miriam had relationships with God, it was a different relationship. So I think that speaks to something very inherently human of, can we just appreciate what we have? Or are we always looking our shoulder to the right and to the left saying, oh, this person has a, you know, it's slightly different, so maybe it's better than mine and this person has something slightly different as opposed to just sort of being content with whatever it is that we have. Um, and clearly in this moment, they're not content with their relationship and they, you know, they have so much more than any of the Israelites, right? It's such a blessing that she is a prophetess, that he is the high priest, that they have this relationship with God. But instead of appreciating that, they just start saying like, oh, well, Moses has it. I see it as Moses having it better. So I'm going to, you know, be upset at him about that. So yeah, I think you're picking up on something very essentially human and something very, an easy trap, it, I would say it is for all of us to fall into. Mm -hmm. Certainly I do. <laughs> but I think that um, the last sentences here, which show Miriam and Aaron in a slightly nicer light because they are aware that this is their brother and he's really on a totally different plane than yeah. than than where they are and i think there is a certain sadness of losing him even if you're losing him to god and the greater good and everything else you're still like losing him and i like that they're making them uh, that that this commentary shows them in a in, in a nicer light rather than just jealous i think that there there is a certain loss that they're feeling that we're never really going to be together again the way we were mm. right right um right and i really i appreciate that and i think uh it's a very interesting take on it to say when you're so other like Moses, and it's true, like he kind of becomes yeah. less and less human as he goes, right? He's this amazing prophet. He doesn't interact so well with other humans as we see. Um, he doesn't really seem to have a relationship with his kids. He doesn't seem to have much of a relationship with his wife, which we're gonna get to in the next sources, whether it's the Cushite wife or it's Zipporah. Um, so in a way he's becoming more and more angel-like and that can be, and that's really challenging for the people who love him, especially for the people, you know, especially Miriam, like Barry said, who, made sure he was born in the first place, who saved him as a kid to make sure that this life existed for him to become less and less human and more and more other is very challenging. Um, and I really want to make sure we get to the next text, so I'm going to move on. But something else I just wanted to bring up from this text that I found interesting is that he's marrying the Kushite woman as embracing his own and marrying his own otherness. So what does it mean when we use people as pawns kind of to embrace our own parts of ourselves? So that's clearly not a healthy relationship for Moses to be entering in if he's marrying her as an outsider to embrace his own outsiderness like what does that mean for her and maybe that's why she doesn't get a name because even for him she's symbolic she's symbolic for miriam and aaron about something he's doing wrong and maybe she's symbolic for him um of something that he's trying to do and how how problematic it can be when we other when we other people like that um so those are kind of the accusing and othering texts now we're gonna get into and please feel free to i just saw there were a few more hands feel free to bring your comments into the next piece um but then i want to do this whole interesting a uh, piece of commentary where it's much more talking about Miriam and Aaron being in solidarity with the other. And it's what uh, Brant talked about before that actually there's this whole thread of um, the commentator saying that Moses actually divorced Zipporah, stopped sleeping with Zipporah, and that this is somehow what Miriam and Aaron are reacting to, which certainly does not seem to be the shot, the, the simple reading of the text. So I wanted to bring it in because I thought it was fascinating. Um, so let's see. Um, Miriam, uh, Marjorie, you haven't really spoken yet. Would you like to read the Rashi for us? Marjorie, you just have to unmute yourself. 
Okay. All right. There you go. Beautiful. Okay. Good to go. Because of the Cushite woman, because of her having been divorced by Moses, uh, note on the previous line, and Miriam and Aaron's phone, she opened the conversation, therefore scripture mentions her first. And how did Miriam know that Moses had separated himself from his wife? Our Nathan answered, Miriam was beside Sephora when it was told to Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesizing in the camp. So I'm just going to pause, pause you for one second, sorry to interrupt, that this happens in this parsha also, where these guys are prophesizing in the camp, people tell Moses, and he says, like, it's actually fine, don't worry, but it's also in the context of this parsha, so that's why they're bringing it up. So go ahead. When Sephora heard this, she exclaimed, woe to the wives of these if they have anything to do with prophecy, for they will separate from their wives, just as my husband has separated from me. It was from this that Miriam knew about it, and she told it to Aaron. Now, what was the case with Miriam, who had no intention to disparage him? She was punished thus severely. How much more will this be so in the case of one who intentionally speaks in disparagement of, his, of this fellow? Yeah, beautiful. So just to say at the end of this Parsha, right, after these three verses, God gets very angry at them, gives Miriam Sarat, which leprosy, some sort of skin disease. She gets exiled out of the camp for a few days. Um, and the Israelite people don't, won't leave until she's healthy again. So she gets a terrible punishment. So that's what the end piece is talking about. Um, so just for time's sake, let's read that. So Marjorie, can you read that also? The next okay. text, number six. Okay. According to the simple meaning of the text, a Gentile black woman, but who had converted, and Aaron and Miriam thought that this was why Moses separated himself from her that his wife was not of Israelite lineage. And they were saying that under no circumstances is this proper. After he had taken her and knew she was a non-Israelite and she didn't deceive him. Therefore, it's not fair to make her sad and separate himself from her. Beautiful, thank you, Marjorie. So these texts are a very different read on what's happening here and what Moses and uh, Aaron are doing specifically, sorry, what Miriam and Aaron are, are doing and specifically Miriam. Um, so I'd love to hear uh, how do you view Miriam after reading these texts and uh, what do you think of these two interpretations? Do you agree? When was this written? The Emek HaDavar? Let me check. Rashi is uh, 11th century and I will check right. out Emek HaDavar. And the second one was 1783, which is, tells you a lot about what they were writing about in 1783. But I'm mm -hmm. curious about this one. It's almost like it's, it, the issue seems to be cultural rather than religious. Meaning, like, Egypt, the, Egypt. say more why cultural? Well, pardon? I said, say more why you, you think it's cultural? People. Yeah, because it's how, how you dress and how you act and how you worship God. But nobody's saying that she wasn't worshiping the same God or the concept of God that the Israelites had. I think it was that Egypt ran the roost for centuries, and ultimately in the 11th century is BCE, when things were falling apart, other people came in to influence the, the feminism, uh, the religion of Egypt. And I think there was a lot of resentment from people who, who were culturally Egyptian, who might not have been racially Egyptian, but were culturally Egyptian to have this being taken off by uh, somebody from an inferior culture. So you think this is uh, like, the, so you think Moses in this read of the text is disparaging of Sephora or of the Kushite woman because somehow he's associating her with Egypt, which he wants to distance himself from. I think they viewed no Egypt as a norm. And yeah. uh, they were dism they're dismayed when the settled order of the universe wasn't anymore. And I'm fascinated by the second excerpt you gave us was 1783 because Dotka, that's when the American Republic was set up and that's when the whole business of slavery was uh, going to come to the fore. Right, and so actually Hanukkah the Devar, this text, I just looked it up, is from eight, it's from the 1800s, so it's actually more, um, it's from like 1840, so closer to the time of the Civil War, actually. Yeah. 
Well, it's interesting. I, I don't think that makes a difference because the point is the whole idea of slavery and inferiority of certain groups was well established in 1783 or 1843. In fact, you might even argue in 1843, it was more established because they had already gone through several slave revolts, and, et cetera. And, and the, uh, the uh, people who, in the North who were writing about get rid of slavery, they thought they were getting rid of an ancient civilization. Yeah. But yeah. was Ha'emek Davar written by people in America or by people in Europe? No, he it was from uh, Lithuania. All right, so Lithuanians, I don't think at the time were all that exercised by the slave issue as <laughs> Americans were. So I don't know if that was something uh, that would uh, come into uh, uh, contention here. I'd like to just go back to, if I may, uh, separate mm -hmm. himself from mm -hmm. his wife. Yeah, go ahead. I think this is probably, I don't know that the word divorce uh, was implied uh, by separation, but uh, it's almost a given by default that a man of power, of vision, of mission is going to be involved in an all-consuming way with uh, that work as is the case with Moses and it's the case with other men of genius and vision and power and so on. And uh, their wives uh, tend to take a, uh, a third or fourth place in, in their world. Yep. So it's, this is uh, you know, just business as usual. And I assume the son, he was not a good father to his sons and he was not a good husband to his wife, even though she uh, took um, certain steps to make sure that he was protected in, in other ways. So what we're dealing with here is the general human dynamic of a man on a mission with a vision and he's in touch with God after all. So he really has no time for the domesticities of life. Right, exactly. And I think that's such an interesting read of this text and such a, such a thing we have seen many times with leaders is how easy it is to say like your family just gets tossed to the side completely. Um, and it's such a more interesting complaint then in some ways for Miriam to step in then and to say like, remember you're a husband, remember that you're actually human beyond your leadership capabilities, you're abandoning your wife. Um, it's a much, it's a much, I think a much kinder read of Miriam in these sources and much many more of the sources go for this read than for the, the for the first one. Um, and, how, and how interesting it is that she's really saying like, stop, stop just being a good leader, be a good husband. That's an important role that you forgot about. You know, that kind of dynamic is not restricted to people in power or exalted people. And this may seem like a silly example, but I think it says something. So for example, in the sports world, you read not uh, infrequently that before an important game or context, uh, contest, the players are, stay away from their wives. They, you know, sexual activity is forbidden because one can't be diverted and the focus needs to be on the game the next day. So I think that what Miriam, what was spoken about is far more generic and um, the context is much broader than people in power or exalted people. Yeah, yeah, Genius right. It's, it's very easy to get consumed by your work and to say <clears throat> whatever it is and to say that, you know, your spouse no longer matters, your kid no longer matters, that you're only gonna focus on this one thing. Um, and in a way, right, like Miriam and Aaron are really advocating for work-life balance <laughs> in this text, if you think of it that way, to say like, remember there's another part of your life and don't toss her aside. All right, so let's take, is there any one last comment? I think Ruth, are you raising your hand? Ruth or Brad? No, okay. So let's just read the last piece because I wanna make sure we end on time. Um, so this is from the book that I was showing you before. I'm happy to send it out in an email um, called Moses' Women by Shira Aronoff Tuckman and Sandra Rappaport. It's a, a great compilation of a bunch of Midrashim on um, really on all of the, the four books where Moses appears. Um, very helpful in English, very clear. All the Hebrew sources are in the back for people who are interested. I really love this book. So I'm happy to send it out in an email to everyone. So this is their take on this um, dynamic between Miriam and Sipora. So let's see who I'm going to ask to read. Um, Alex, 
you looks like you're there. Are you uh, dealing with a grandchild or can you read for us? You're still muted. I'll give Alex one more second. Looks like he's really trying hard. And then if it doesn't work, we'll ask somebody else. All right, it doesn't seem like it's working. Sorry, Alex. So, um, Terry, do you want to read for us? Okay, why don't you let someone else read, though, because I talk a lot. Okay. Um, <laughs> who would like to volunteer to read to us instead very much? Anyone? Would like to. Sheila, go ahead. Can you, can you hear Julie, me you now? Just got, oh, Alex, I can hear you now. So why don't you read the first two paragraphs, and then Sheila, you can read the last one. How about that? You got it. All right, Alex, go okay. ahead. Read the first two. Implicit in the discussion of many of the commentaries is that Miriam befriended her sister-in-law, Zipporah, and that the two women developed a close personal relationship. We can appreciate this intimacy because both Miriam and Zipporah share a vital life mission and uh, raison d'etre, loving and caring for Moses. Where Miriam left off watching over her brother after he was taken into the palace as a prince of Egypt, Sephora assumed this mission when she married the fugitive Moses and began to build him a home in the wilderness beyond Midian. Now, for the first time in the Moses narrative, the commentaries, the commentaries connect these two heroic women and allow us to glimpse their private conversations. It is the reason, according to Alchit, that Miriam speaks first in verse 12, 1. The commentary, appreciating Miriam's close affinity for her sister-in-law, suggests that Miriam is so troubled by Tzipporah's presumptive loss of faith among the Israelites because of Moses' absence from, absence from her tent, that she broaches the subject with her other brother, hoping that the two can propose a solution. All right, Sheila, hit it. You want yeah. me to continue? The, the commentaries in recounting these conversations demonstrate their exquisite sensitivity to both Zipporah's conjugal loneliness and to Miriam's dual loyalties. Miriam, ever her brother's protector, has naturally be also befriended and allied herself with his wife. She will attempt to serve them both well by confiding the situation to Aaron and seeking his counsel. The reader will attempt, will see her attempt, um, that's all we can see. That's all oh, we can see. Sorry. The, text, oh. like, the reader will see her attempt will have devastating consequences. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I just thought this was a really interesting take about what this relationship was like. So, any quick um, comments on this last text before we wrap it up? Miriam, go ahead. Just, uh, just a general comment that um, Moshe was uh, unusually influenced and supported and protected by women. I mean, symbolic mother figures almost, uh, Shifran Pua, uh, whose, um, whose work paved the way for his existence, uh, his mother Yocheved, his uh, sister who launched him on that little uh, voyage of his, the daughter Batya, as the Midrash says, uh, the daughter of the, uh, of the Pharaoh. And Tipor, of course, uh, who, uh, as I said, uh, in many ways that uh, only one of which is mentioned in, in a strange way in the Bible later on. So he is very entitled by his upbringing and also by all well, that mothering. So it's, uh, yeah. it's an unusual, uh, interesting point to make about him in terms of women in his life. Yeah, beautiful. All right, I'm just gonna stop sharing because I would like to see all your faces. Um, yeah, so I just thought it was such a interesting, um, such an interesting take on what it might, what this relationship might have been like between these two women. To really think that Miriam was saying, out of a sense of solidarity, that they really 
because she loved her brother so much, she wanted to have a good relationship with her with his wife. Um, and because she loved his wife, she wanted to make sure that they were still having marital relations and that the text is really trying to balance those two things. So um, just thought that the, the two different sections and the two different way the commentaries are reading this are very different interpretations of what Miriam and Aaron are doing. Are they saying to Moses, like, you think you're better than, and you married this other person and we're gonna accuse her and be angry at her because she's a good out for us to be mad at you. Um, and because she was black and because she wasn't Jewish and because of this and because of that, we don't like her. So do we other someone else when we're feeling threatened or do we actually stand in solidarity with them and say, according to these texts that Moses had separated himself from her to say, you know, I actually, Miriam is gonna stand up with, with Sipora and to say there might be consequences for me and there's terrible consequences for her in the end. But to say like, I love this woman and I love my brother and even if she's being seen as other, that's not okay. And I'm gonna stand with her to make sure that she gets her proper place in society. Um, so that these texts and these two different reads felt incredibly relevant to me right now, especially after everything that's been happening the last two weeks and when do we stand in solidarity with the other and when do, is it easy to accuse the other and how are we in relationship with each other? How do we listen? Um, uh, felt very relevant to me. So thank you all for learning with me. I'm happy to stay on for five more minutes to listen to any other thoughts or comments you have, but wanted to honor the, the time. So anyone who needs to leave to go back to work or do anything else, feel free to leave. And if anyone else has any last comments, I'd love to stay and listen. And just to say before everyone goes, next week is the last week of this little uh, Torah for today piece. I'll be teaching again. Um, <laughs> And then after that, me and Rabbi Katz, I heard there was a lot of desire for something to have be happening similar to this over the summer. So we're figuring out exactly what they, that will look like, but we'll be team teaching still and probably around the Parsha and more stuff will be coming out about that soon. So it's the last of this little section and uh, we'll probably take a little break and then we'll be back for some more. Thank I have you. a question okay. that's kind of irrelevant. I've, um, been, I've, been staring, I've been staring at the picture that's right next to the window. That looks like a candle. The yes. black and white picture. Who did that? Um, it was a wedding present, so I don't actually know. <laughs> because I have the feeling I know the orders. Oh, okay. Great. Um, what I have at first. Katie, no, I like it very much. Yes. Katie, I think for me, if I kind of really had to summarize what this is all about, is how does one uh, react? Or well, how does one engage? somebody for the first time. And let's assume that this other person in some basic ways uh, is different from you. In other words, it, it could be the other in quotes. If you, if in the first encounter, you don't think specifically about the otherness, but the sameness. Sameness might be uh, verbalized as we're all, we're all created in the image of God. Or, uh, I don't know, <laughs> Harry Stack Sullivan, who is a famous psychiatrist, uh, means anything to anyone. But his expertise was in schizophrenia. And so people were writing about schizophrenics and psychotics. And they are, you know, they are a preeminent other. Yeah. So all of the papers were on how these schizophrenic and psychotic people were different from the rest of us. Harry Stack Sullivan, on the other hand, said, we are all more human than otherwise. Namely, that in the first encounter, if one um, accesses how we're the same before one gets to the otherness, it changes the whole flavor of the otherness. And to understand that there's a basic sameness makes for a conversation uh, and makes for dialogue. If your emphasis is only on the otherness, it, um, it breaks down conversation and the ability to have a meaningful dialogue. So where you start, I think is really important in how the relationship unfolds. Yeah, beautiful, thank you, right. So do you start on saying, do you start on what we have in common or do you start on thinking about everything that's different? Yeah, very, very good point. Rabbi, can I ask you a question? Sure. Yeah. Ever since uh, an hour ago, you mentioned uh, that, uh, I don't know if it was a midrash or the story that Moses went away for 40 years and had this other uh, life as a king and married a queen 
and the Torah, which is usually so detailed and so specific in the first uh, book of Shemos, the, the, there's just that one sentence where it says he, go, he went away and he was a stranger in a strange land. And in the next sentence, he's back and, and it's in some amount of time has passed. And there's no mention of this sojourn uh, in an African nation, where do where can one read about that? I mean, that seems like the first first example of the Torah kind of turning its back on a story that sh that would have had incredible consequences in this discussion that we had today. Yeah, so I'm happy to I'm happy to send the midrash out if you want the translation of the midrash. Um, but yeah, I mean that's the thing that's like amazing about midrash if you've never studied it, um, and certainly the first time when I was exposed to it, like they go the rabbis go kind of crazy. Like they have really, it's like a really fun creative writing exercise for them to really think about, you know, what was Moses doing for all this time? Was he just in Midian, or maybe let's you know think about him being in an African nation and what would that have meant and what would that mean for his story? Um, and it's one of the reasons that I think, you know, as modern readers and modern commentators, we can play a lot with the text too and to see, think about how it's relevant to us because they certainly do, right? They have lots of fun with any gaps they see, any interesting grammar pieces they see, you know, they, they try to figure out how it was relevant and what's the stuff that was missing. So if they could imagine he was in Ethiopia for 40 years, we could imagine all sorts of interesting stuff too. Erica, did you have your hand raised? Yes, uh, I just have to tell you, I color commentary in the background. Uh, Shira Aronoff Tuckman, her mother, well, she's one of my best friends, and mm. uh, her mother is a seminary graduate in the same class as our own Debbie Eiferman. Oh. Uh, yes, and uh, Sandra Rappaport is Diane <laughs> Sharon's sister. Is Diane Sharon's, I didn't hear you say it again? Sister, she's Diane Sharon's sister. Oh, wow. Oh. So yes, well, I, small world. I, uh, they're both terrific. I, I share, of course, I'm friendly. I'm not friendly with Sandra, but I share is amazing. I'm going to write to her and I'm going to tell her that you um, quoted her and that you said, I, I wrote it down, you said you love this book. I so, do. Please tell her. It has been, since I, I will, discovered it. Tell her. This is lovely. You just really made my day. Oh, great. Yeah, please. Please and tell her to write some more. I want more. Like she only wrote two books and I love them. They're Pat wonderful. So. Matriarchs is one. Right. Right. The pink book, right? And this yeah. one, right, right. She, she's working. She's, okay. uh, she's got other things in the works. Excellent. Looking forward to reading them when they come out. What was the name of her other book? Passions of the Matriarchs. Passions of the Matriarchs. Yeah. She is a dermatologist by profession and a scholar by passion. Oh, okay. <laughs> as, as she, she teaches at uh, KJ. She's got a huge following. They started off in a small classroom, then they needed a hall, then they, she's, oh, okay. uh, she's a very interesting woman. And wow. she's, if you know people in Riverdale, she's Maya Bernstein's aunt. If you know Maya Bernstein, so, yeah. Excellent, thank you for thank that. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. All right, any, uh, any other last, any last comments before we wrap up for the day? I just wanna say that in terms of uh, Zipporah and Miriam, like, being together, it's it's a common sisterhood, and uh, you know that that, that or, or to a mother uh, a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law when when you have the uh, the son husband or sibling in common. Right, right, and it's not always an obvious bond, right? And I think that's what the first reads are saying that it's easy for these sort of in-law relationships to be complicated and challenging, and sometimes to bring up. Um, complications between the siblings and that it actually, you know, in the, in the read of the second batch of commentators to say, actually, this was a really important, loving, special right. relationship for her. Right. Thank you. This was great. Yeah, you're very welcome. All right. So if anyone wants to stay on and schmooze, what we did the last time is I made Terry the co-host. And so that way she can end the meeting whenever she wants to. And that way everyone can just <laughs> hang out with each other as long as they want to hang out. So Terry, would you like to do that again? All right. I just, I just click leave. Right. So yeah, let me, I'm going to make you co-host first. Um, so that way you will have, you will have the power. So Terry now has the power. <laughs> um, so feel free, anyone to stay on and schmooze. Um, I'll actually make you host. Thank you, Rabbi. And uh, always a pleasure to learn with all of you. Looking forward Thank to learning you. with you next week. And feel free to email me with any questions. I'll send the midrash out and the books out so everyone knows where to get them. Um, and yeah, I always happy to be in dialogue and always happy to learn with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.
Enjoy your smooth. Bye. Bye. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, Mort. <laughs> Hi, Suzanne. I set up a park bench. We're meeting now, right? Do you want to talk to her on Zoom or privately? Vivian, give me a call. Okay, anyone else or should I end it? You tell me. Should I end it now? Yes, no? <laughs> Yeah, because this is just us. Okay, I'm going to end it. Thank you. Bye. Have a good week, everyone. Stay healthy, safe, and sane. Bye.